Hi, I'm Chris Ott, and this is a part 12 of the series, What Mayor Baba Really Taught. Now, to, today I'm going to do a um, summary of the various um, um, teachings we've tried to correct over the last 11 videos. And uh, let's see how this goes. This will help me when I get to my book just as these talks are, are meant to benefit um, the, the book. The book is kind of just uh, the same thing, kind of an encapsulation of what I'm saying here. And it's going to be quite short. And it may be comprised of these uh, approximately a dozen points here. All right. So let's go back to what we've covered so far. Um. The first thing is the inspiration for this, these talks and the, the work that I've done over the last couple of decades of my life in regard to uh, my own ph philosophy and um, its connection with Baba's teaching and studying his teaching also. And that is that um, in, um, in um, 1958, uh, Baba went, went up to the hill where his went up on the hill where his t tomb had been built years before, uh, 20 years earlier. And he had done a lot of work in the in his own grave uh, originally, which is just a grave. And then the, as the tomb was built over it, actually that goes even back further than uh, 1938 when he was in it, using it as kind of a hole in the ground. But then in 1938 they built the, the structure and the dome and everything that's there. And it was um, going up there with his disciples of, that he made the statement that first going over the work that he did in that tomb, bef um, that after his body was brought there, um, which would later happen um, in January 31st, 1969. So 70 years after I dropped my body, which is how he described dying, this place will turn into a place of pilgrimage where lovers of God, philosophers, and celebrities will come to pay homage. Okay, so that's a, that's a prophecy, and that correlates with the year uh, 2039, which comes up in just 16 years. And um, <clears throat> I've been thinking about this for, for um, more than 16 years already, so <laughs> I've been way out there. But now it's getting closer. And so I, I, I first started paying attention to this quote when I started f studying philosophy about 24 years ago. And uh, because it had the word philosophers in it, which is kind of rare. Baba didn't generally talk about philosophers. And so the question comes, I've, I've thought about it all these years, like, why would philosophers pay homage? Why, why of all the professions, philosophers, they don't pay homage to them today. So I would say, I'm going to say a little more about the wording the, of this prophecy um, in another video. But for now, about the philosophers, I would say now, well, something has happened in philosophy. There's been a change. And only recently did I read a quote by Baba where he said, I've come to bring about a revolution in man's thinking, the slowest of all revolutions. So something has changed in the thinking. Um, maybe it's already happened, but people, people haven't realized it yet. You know, that um, in Baba, you have the potential for all, just a whole new way of organizing reality. And that's, why this is so interesting to me philosophically, Baba's teachings. And so this quote inspires me to write this short book, which is called What Mayor Baba Really Taught, A Letter to Philosophers. It's a letter to philosophers because I want them to know that whatever people are telling them Baba taught, be careful, go look, let me tell you what he really taught, because they don't know. And I'm going to get into that because it's kind of a serious problem. But I don't think it's a permanent problem. The followers now of Baba are all old, 
with very few exceptions, and they're going to pass away. In the next 16 years, um, they'll be gone, basically. Um, so, and a new generation, I think, will come along and find these videos and my little book and other, and start looking more closely at Bob and get interested and go, oh my God, there's a revolution in here. There is. There's a revolution in thinking. So, now let's get on with the points that I've covered already in this video series. Um, number one, in spite of a kind of a, uh, um, a misunderstanding, Baba did not have no teachings. Baba once said, I've come not to teach but to awaken. That was part of his, his universal message. He wrote that in 1964, long after he had given all his books. <laughs> which are full of teachings. So it's kind of like a Kohen. It's like, um, he means um, that's not his purpose, it's just to to um, entertain us with ideas. It's the, 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 the teaching that he's given us is part of that awakening, which is its real purpose. Awakening to a new, a new understanding. I've come to bring about a revolution in man's thinking. That revolution in man's thinking is an awakening of a kind. And you have to have the teachings. They're part of it. But that's not his main point. It is in service to this higher purpose. Okay, the next one is um, number two. Baba did not teach people to try, not try to understand him. This is a thing that's risen up in, in the decades since he passed away. That Baba didn't, don't try to understand him. Don't read his books. Don't try to understand them. This is just not true. Um, there are... Definitely quotes where Baba said that understanding him was very important to try to understand him and um, try to make, you know, especially if you, if, you, if you care about him, wouldn't you want to understand what he's saying? Um, the idea that he does, well, anyway, this is similar to the other one about um, um, to teachings. And he, there's a quote where Baba says, understanding has no meaning, but it's a, it's part of the context of it is a message that he put up for his disciples at that time that in this ashram this is most important this is the next most important like an understanding has no meaning <laughs> what's important really ultimately in that list was obedience obey the rules of the ashram so it's out of context let me give a couple quotes showing that baba was did not have a negative attitude toward understanding and i could give other quotes but i'm giving two the first is from a book called The Ocean of Love by Delia de Leon. It's page 85. This is Baba. It's in a letter to a woman who was um, upset with Baba, and he was replying to her. And um, it said, The gift of understanding is more precious than any other attribute of love, be it expressed in service or sacrifice. So here he's calling understanding an attribute of love. Love can be blind, selfish, greedy, ignorant. But love with understanding can be none of these things. Isn't that incredible? The idea that you can just sort of love, but you don't have any idea. <laughs> You're not interested in what the person is trying to communicate. It's kind of, kind of preposterous. Um, it, is, it is, understanding is, the divine fruit of pure love the rare fruit of, or flower of the universe. So it's giving some pretty high praise for understanding. And now here's a quote, and it has the word understanding right at the end. Um, it is helpful for my lovers to come together and, th and think and talk about me, to discuss my teachings and messages, compare notes with each other, and cooperatively try to come closer to me in understanding and spirit. So there's the word understanding. Try to get, come closer to him in understanding, and to get together and have fun doing it. It's not a it's not a like um, a awful thing. Like it, it's I've I've always found it kind of fun and interesting. Okay, so number three, and in this little survey, this little uh, review of what we've already covered before we go on. Um, in spite of an idea that has slipped in, well, not really slipped in, it got in very early into the Baba cult. The idea of ascended masters was brought over for, with a lot of sources. One was 
Theosophy was very popular at the time that Baba was first teaching. And so if you went to a uh, an occult bookstore or a spiritual bookstore in the 1930s, you would get books by the Theosophists. That's what you'd get. That was spiritualism and spiritual on spiritism, the communication with spirits or something on the other side was the main vogue of the day. So they assumed a lot that Baba must be, when he's, you know, he's spiritual, he must be talking like this. It's kind of incredible to think about today, but that's part of how, what's, how it slipped in. Um, but there are other reasons. Um, in very recent Protestant Christianity, the idea of having a personal relationship with Jesus has become popular. But there's a lot of literature um, recently um, pointing out that it's not biblical and it's very recent and it's it's not Christ, real Christian teaching that you have a personal relationship with Jesus. If you did, there would have to be eight billion Jesuses, you know, if we were all, if we all had our little Jesus. No, it, it's not like that. In real Christianity, Jesus, after he passes away, he's transcendent, he's completely transcendental. He, the sitting at the right hand of the Father isn't um, mean like we think. It means he's, he's, he is, he's transcended the universe. And in Catholicism, they communicate with the saints who are kind of, you know, uh, intermediaries because he's so um, aloof. But in modern times, it's gotten more and more like he's just a character. And they got all these songs like, walked with me and he talked with me but those are all from the 20th century you can check it out um baba said actually when a master dies he takes no further interest in the affairs of the gross world not even a christ hence those who imagine that a dead master is responding to their prayers or watching them are wrong the only um the only god on the earth are the, are the living perfect masters in the flesh. And Baba does, makes this very clear throughout his writing. Um, you would think a body's not important, but that would be a leftover from like uh, Manichaeanism or something, you know, the, the terribleness of the flesh or something. No, the flesh is an illusion, but there's nothing bad about it. The, the master takes on, comes into the illusion, takes on the, um, flesh in order to help us. He doesn't do so when he ascends. Now, where does Baba go when he dies? Baba makes it totally clear. I've pointed out exactly where. He said, the avatar goes to state B of the ten states of God, which is in his major book, um, God Speaks. There he has experience of reality, but not of the illusion. And he doesn't go there after a hundred years. That's not Baba's teaching. He goes there right away. When he drops his body, that's when he goes there. Now, um, this last quote, not a single spiritual master ever required any vehicle save his own physical body. The silent word, page, page 262. All right, so now number four. Baba does not teach monotheism. Monotheism is the teaching that there's only one God. Um, in a, kind of, there's not two. Baba's clear about that, and there's not many gods. He says many gods is madness, in fact. That's a quote by Baba. But he's not, it's not the same as monotheism, that there is, there is just one God. Um, Baba said, even to say there is one God is wrong. God is so infinitely one that he cannot even be called one. Because this is the idea, of like, how many gods are there? Well, there's just one God, but that implies, you know, there could be two. Um, one may be, um, so... It's really truer to say, in Baba's teaching, there's only God. And so um, what I like to say is uh, Baba doesn't teach monotheism. He teaches what I would call theistic monism, you know, a godly oneness. That everything, there is only God. Nothing else exists. Okay, number five. Baba does not teach that God created the world. It's sad, but... People teach their children this, and then they, they, who are Baba lovers, and then the kids go to school and they learn about, you know, 
uh, Darwin and, and the Big Bang, and they go, oh, well, we were so unscientific. I was taught that Baba made the world. Well, that's not what Baba said. If they knew what Baba said, they would be pretty excited because it's much more like modern thinking, the kind of stuff they're hearing uh, in, in classes that are talking about um, um, quantum physics and, and uh, the holographic universe and things like that. They would be like, wow, it's really, it's really like that. That's what Baba says. Baba says, who says God has created the world? We have created it, created it by our imagination. All right. So um, that's Lord Meher, original print version, page 4097. All right. Baba also does not teach the Big Bang. Or more recently, some uh, person who was giving a talk is talking about the Big Ooze. No, Baba doesn't talk about a big ooze or a big bang. Nothing ever bang. <laughs> and when Baba talks about the own point, this is not a point in space. Um, it's not the point that corresponds to the place and time of the big bang. That would be a total misunderstanding of what Baba's talking about when he talks about the own point. Um, the own point is not a place. It is the point of perception from which the illusion of places and all other illusory qualities falsely appears to arise. It's a subjective point. But as Baba says in God Speaks, from that point, the world appears and goes on expanding. In other words, it's an appearance. And philosophy and appearance means it doesn't exist. All right, seven. Baba did not teach Darwinian evolution, nor is what he teaches even, even co-possible with Darwinian evolution. Evo Darwinian evolution is a theory where where the world of the forms in biology formed out of chance and accidents, chance mutation, DNA breaks in DNA, and then lucky accidents. In Baba, there's no accident. God was looking for his own identity, and each each form that evolved had more consciousness than the one before. It was a medium capable of having more consciousness. You could say a larger brain, more more nervous system, uh, you know, better eyes and organs and th the ability to, to think and process what it perceives. It was constantly perceiving more. Now that can't be a coincidence. It never goes the other way. It doesn't go back to where we have less and less consciousness. You only have more. Some people can make jokes that people are getting dumber, but that's not an evolutionary point. So. Baba's evolution is not compossible with Darwin's. Now, the next one is that the world is an illusion. Um, the Baba's statement that the world is an illusion is not, as it is in, say, Hinduism or some other religions or, or, or um, cults, it's not just a magical claim. It's not a th something you rely on faith because it doesn't really make any sense. And that is why a lot of Baba people have to endure the idea that the world is an illusion. They, they just have to, like, they don't see how it could be, and they do things like, well, I don't understand how it could be an illusion when it's so solid. I've already talked about that. Yes, it's a solid. The, the quality of solidity is part of the illusion. But, um, but I explain the, the illusion in a way you can understand in my story about the um, Parisian Café. And so, uh, um, the, so you can actually understand what Baba means with your mind. It's not something you have to have faith. As a matter of fact, when you understand philosophy and you understand the mind-body problem, you act, it actually requires faith to believe in the real world or the external world or the material world. And I'll quote one of the most famous philosophers that ever lived who said exactly that. This is Kant, Immanuel Kant. Seven, the year 1781, in his very famous book, The Critique of Pure Reason. He writes, It still remains a scandal to philosophy that the existence of things outside of us, outside of our perception, must be accepted merely on faith, and that if anyone thinks good to doubt their existence, we are unable to counter his doubts by any satisfactory proof. So we only have faith in the real world. The fact that we have an illusory world, we have an immediate experience of it. Therefore, it is self-evident. And so, it does not require faith. The um, belief that it's real requires faith. 
Now, I think if you followed the other videos, you'll understand what I was just saying. So now number nine. Baba did not teach that God is consciousness. This is a new age belief. I like it. It sounds nice. David Icke says that. And it comes very close to capturing what, what Baba is saying. There's like this one consciousness and we're all, we're all sharing in it individually. Yeah, that's kind of true by the time you're a human. But it's not true originally. Originally, God existed before there was consciousness. The first state of God um, in the ten states of God the, the, the possibility of consciousness isn't even, isn't even conceivable. That's what Baba says. So if the first state of God, in the original, the most original state of God, there's no consciousness, then God is obviously not consciousness. God is something that precedes consciousness, but it has the capacity to acquire consciousness. And that is the whole uh, 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 advancing stream of life, is the gradual increase of consciousness. That, that's what Baba teaches. Now, number 10, Baba did not teach the, the um, strange and macabre notion of transmigration of the soul. Transmigration of the soul is very similar to possession, where a little, a little spirit, you know, uh, leaves your body and then travels. That's the migration. And then it goes into a, a fetus, say. Well, that's, it, that's very macabre. And it's not, it's not intuitive at all, because where is this little thing? I don't see it. it it's, it's, it's just, um, it's not Baba's teaching. Baba teaches that there's only one soul, and that soul is not really in space. It precedes space and time, just like the original state of God precedes consciousness. It precedes space. So therefore, it's not in space, and therefore, it can't travel around in space to migrate. So um, Baba's um, biographer, C.B. Purdom, um, called this idea of transmigration of the soul, the movement of the soul, he called it a, um, a crude fantasy. And that's in the God-Man, page 422, at least of the, the edition that I used for this, for this um, video. And now, number 11, and this is the last one I have here. Baba did not teach that people need a personal relationship with the avatar after he dies. The whole reason that the avatar this comes every 700, 1400 years, is so that you can have a relationship with God by going and meeting him, traveling and uh, writing a letter to his um, you know, secretary, and you have to go and meet him. That is the personal relationship, and that's worth everything. But um, when he dies, there are still five perfect masters who are of the same consciousness. They're just not the original soul. They're not the Christ, but they are of the same a fully God-realized state of consciousness. And they're always on the earth, according to Baba. They're part of the hierarchy. And, um, but they are not an ascended master hierarchy. They are in bodies on, in the world. And they would be hard to find, but if you're worthy of uh, finding one, you'll find one. And if you go looking, I always think, for, for a perfect master, well, maybe you won't find a perfect master right away. Maybe you'll find somebody with a little less advanced, but he still might be able to help you and get you ready. And when you are ready, as they say, when the, when the student is ready, the, the master comes. So you, you start where you are. Um, all right. So um, this idea of a personal relationship, uh, as I said at the beginning, is part of a, a new kind of um, 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 development in Protestant Christianity, be part of the evangelical movement, where you know a guy goes on TV and he says he's selling you a, real, a personal relationship with Jesus, which is very appealing to have you know a, this imaginary friend, and then <laughs> you come on down, your 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 relatives will wait, and then you know you stand before the thing and you think you're you're getting this relationship. <laughs> So uh, um, I could go more into that another time. But it's really sad because Baba, Baba's followers are so worried about this. Just don't worry about it. Just know that he is the avatar. Study his teachings. That's what he said was the highest form of meditation, was to study the words of a master. He even gave an example of a, of a piece of reading to, to study as a meditation. And, um, and then try to be a good person. Try to be a good person. And uh, um, as for love, if you love Baba, great. 
who's telling you not to. <laughs> but, I, but you don't need to communicate. You don't need him to, to, to all that. That that's something called um, necromancy, the communication with the dead, and the, we don't need that. All right. Um, that's all I've got for this for this video. Uh, I have more to say, but I wanted to do this. Um, and uh, well, I don't have anything else to add right now. Take care. I'll see you in part 13 next time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.